Wow. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, welcome everyone to tonight's event. Thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, really excited to have Mark Fowler and Ken Collier come talk to you tonight. Um, I just quick show of quick questions before we begin. How many of you guys actually know about ThoughtWorks? Show of hands. Okay, majority of you do. If you don't know about ThoughtWorks, I'm happy to talk about it to you guys afterwards, just so you know who we are. But without further ado, I'm going to introduce my other MC partner here. Hi, my name is John Beakley um, with ThoughtWorks Plant Principal, and uh, as Grant indicated, anybody wants to learn more about ThoughtWorks, we're happy to do that. Uh, Want to introduce you to tonight's event. What we'll be doing is uh, Ken Collier is going to talk about big data. And then what we're going to do from a logistical perspective is take a little break uh, and then give people time to refresh their uh, uh, drinks, get a little bit more food, use the restroom, and then uh, Mark is going to come back and talk about software development in the 21st century. So we think it's going to be a very, very exciting evening and we're glad that you're all here and uh, appreciate your attendance. So with that, what I want to go with, oh, the one other thing I want to talk about is if you, uh, tweeting about it, uh, TWSF, we're, you know, feel, go ahead and do that. Uh, more than happy to have and excited to have you go ahead and do that. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Ken and uh, move into the uh, big data section of the uh, evening. Thank you. All right. Uh, is my microphone working? No? Yeah. There you go. It's just not close enough to my face. How are you all? Have a good day? Good. I struggled a little getting in today because I guess you had some rain this morning, but when I got here it was beautiful. I love it when San Francisco feels like spring. Get us into this. Um, so I'm Ken Collier. Um, I am the a Agile Analytics Practice Lead for ThoughtWorks. Um, we are focused um, largely on advanced analytics, which I'm going to talk a little bit about tonight. Uh, not, not predominantly any one technology, but largely we're using NoSQL technologies for repositories and languages like R and Clojure for, uh, for our programming. So if you want to talk about those things, we can talk about those later. But what I wanted to talk about today is this topic, big data analytics, and, and the big data word, and, and you guys li are living kind of right in the heart of where this buzzword has has uh, evolved or, or grown out of. Um, I wanted us to take a look at a little bit of, at, at big data analytics, specifically big data analytics, not just the whole spectrum of big data topics. And I want us to look at big data and what we mean when we talk about big data. And, and there's you know a whole lot of these kinds of discussions. What is big data? What is big data? We'll talk a little bit about that. But then I want to quickly move into analytics and how analytics ties into the big data emerging technologies or the emerging technologies that enable us to do things that we couldn't do 10 years ago because the data was too complex or, or difficult to deal with. Um, after that, I want us to talk a little bit about agility in analytics and what it means to be agile with your analytics if, you're, if this is something that you're moving into in your organization. And then we'll talk about hype, uh, whether, there's, whether this is all just hype and hucksterism or whether there's something real here. So let's get started. Um, if I can, maybe I should put my uh, receiver in and into the... So I'm going to hit you with a couple of things that you've probably read or heard or, or seen in passing, and I, and I won't belabor this. The, the, the big part of big data is, um, to me, not the most interesting part of big data. Um, we'll talk about what I think is more interesting in just a second. But just to give you a couple of data points, or a few data points, um, we have, in the last two years, it's been estimated, we have generated in our world 98%, um, roughly 98% of the, the total amount of data that has been collected through history. Uh, that, that we as humans have collected through history. Um, that to me is kind of staggering. We are uh, approaching, rapidly approaching, uh, multiple zettabytes of data. A zettabyte is a, a billion terabytes. Um, 
We at ThoughtWorks have a project that is not quite yet started, but it's a, a, an astrophysics project. It's called um, the Square Kilometer Array. Uh, it's an array of telescopes in Australia and South Africa that are expected to produce 11 petabytes of data per observation which is every night. So once a night, it's a, these, the, this square kilometer array is going to generate 11 petabytes of data. Um, that's just, that's just uh, astronomy. Um, you can imagine the volume of data that's coming from all of the other uh, devices, sensors, people, uh, etc. Uh, on any given day. But, but to me, big is kind of yesterday's news. I don't mean to say that in a denigrating way, because big is complicated, big make, high volume makes it difficult. But what's really interesting to me are some of the other factors. Doug Laney is a Gartner analyst who coined the, the, the three V's of big data. If you haven't heard the three V's, they are velocity, or sorry, they are volume, which we just talked about. They are velocity, it includes velocity, so how fast this data is coming at us and how fast it is degrading into uh, old, old information. So imagine a tweet. Uh, a tweet doesn't have much of a shelf life. It's, it's, it's pretty stale within about a day or less. Um, that's very different than most corporate operational and transactional data, which, which uh, has relevance for much longer periods of time. How fast it's coming at us and how fast it's growing stale. And the third V is variety. How, how disparate this data is, the sources that it comes from, the structure that it, that it has. Uh, all of these things, to me, combine into something that's very interesting, which is data messiness. So when we're dealing with this data, especially for analytics, we typically spend about 80 to 90% of our effort just wrestling the data into a format that we can begin to do analytics against. 80 to 90% of our effort is, is spent in just preparing and munging and jockeying the data to get it ready for analysis. So there's a huge opportunity, and I, and I expect to see this over the next 10 or so years, uh, there's a huge opportunity for tools and techniques and technologies that will help us wrangle these large volumes of, of disparate uh, high velocity data into a format that can be analyzed very quickly because of the velocity bit at the top. If it takes us, if it takes us very long to prepare the data, then by the time we start analyzing it, it's, it's too late in some cases. Um, there's some other interesting factors that converge to make this uh, a really unique time, I think, in our history. Uh, one is there is a tremendous and increasingly tremendous availability of very interesting data. Data from a wide variety of sources, and we're going to talk about some of those um, and, and hopefully spark some ideas for you about the availability of data that's relevant to you that you might not even be thinking about. There's, of course, emerging technologies. Hadoop ecosystem is the, tends to be the first one that people think of when they start talking about big data, right? Hadoop gets, has gotten a lot of good press, but there's a lot of really powerful emerging technologies. Neo4j for graph databases, uh, et cetera, and Martin will talk a little bit more about the, those. Um, and there is a shrinking corporate life expectancy. Um, how many of you, if I said, if I, if I asked you to guess which are the top three most innovative companies, and I'm not even going to qualify, you know, where, how widespread, what would you shout out a few that you would think would be the top, within the top three most innovative companies? SaltWorks, 3M. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Who said 3M? Ah, 3M. Apple. Apple. Google. Yeah. Apple. So what's interesting, I, so you hit, the, you hit 3M pretty quickly. 3M is ranked among the top three. And Google and Apple bubbled into one, number one and two. What strikes me about that is that 3M started over 75 years ago as a company. And 3M has grown. What would you say 3M produces? Everything. They, in fact, what 3M does is innovate. That's their whole business. They're in all kinds of, of places. GE is similar. Uh, largely through acquisitions, I think. But anyway, um, it, the, what's interesting to me about this is that companies like Google and Apple are such young companies, and many of the other uh, highly innovative companies that you might think of are very, very young. We've, 
we can look at life expectancies of companies and they tend to be much, much shorter than they were uh, 25, 30, 50 years ago. So the frontier of opportunity, to my mind, is messiness. Not, not the bigness of big data. And so, so big data is it's a term that's here to stay for at least a few more years. Um, I think, I don't know, if you're like me, you kind of get tired of this word that doesn't really have a, a clear definition, but it's ubiquitous. We're hearing it everywhere we go. Um, I, I'm fine with that, uh, as long as we have a shared understanding of what that means. The problem I have with the term big data is it tends to put too much emphasis on the big part, not so much on the other factors. And there are more than just those three Bs that we talked about. Let's take a look at some of these characteristics. So here's a few uh, interesting uh, observations. So in, uh, in 2003, the number of humans on the Earth far outweighed the number of things that, that were connected to the internet. By 2008, the number of things connected to the internet exceeded the number of people on the planet. And by 2020, there are expected to be 50 billion things connected to the internet on our planet. So the number of things are growing tremendously. Here's one example of this. There's a company called Spark, a Dutch company. And what Spark does is they produce a, a wireless telemetry unit that cattle ranchers can put on their cattle. And the cattle ranchers can monitor all kinds of information about the cattle. They can monitor the health, the body temperature of the cows. They can monitor where they are out in the fields grazing. They can monitor which ones may be pregnant uh, and, and which ones need special care. Um, they can monitor all kinds of things about the, how much milk is being produced by milk producing cows, etc. And these cows, they, each cow transmits about 200 megabytes per year of data. That's not a tremendous volume per cow, but that becomes pretty interesting volumes when you add up all the cows, right? So, so that's kind of an interesting, unusual use of, of sensor data. Uh, to, to provide information to something that formerly might have been considered more of a low-tech uh, thing. This is, a, this is a project that I was on a couple of years ago. We were, um, I'll tell you a little, give you a little backstory, and then I'll talk through what, what happened here. So we were, my team was asked to look at data about commodities in general, but mostly grain production. Grain production, corn production, wheat production, all of that, that sort of class of commodities. The, 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 there were several different, it was kind of an open-ended question that, the, that our sponsor asked us to dive into to examine relationships between events that happen in the world over time and how that relates to the production of grain, corn, wheat, grass, etc. Um, around the globe. So you get, kind of get the picture. So we looked at weather data. We looked at geopolitical events. This is all data that's publicly available. Everything that we did was to pull data from outside of the firewall of the, of the company that we were working with. Social media information, analyst blogs, natural disasters. We even looked at uh, grocery store advertisements that come out, those, those circulars that generally come out every Wednesday, they're also posted online. We were scraping those screens to get information about um, grain-related products. Here's a, this was one of the interesting uh, discoveries and set of correlations that we found over time. In, two, in May of 2010, there was a record heat wave in Russia. You may remember this, this was on the news. Um, I don't think I paid much attention to it until uh, I started hearing NPR stories about Russian crop failures and wildfires that, that uh, blew up nationwide. So the, the whole country of Russia was on fire um, at this time, and Russia is a big country, right? So there were large, large uh, amounts of land that were, that were burning. So by July 2010, wild, wildfires were destroying whatever crops were left. In August, uh, President Medvedev decided to halt all grain exports. Now, Russia is one of the three biggest grain-producing countries in the world. 
uh, U.S., Canada, I'm sorry, China, U.S. and Canada, and um, and Russia are are they're all the, the big the biggies in, in grain production. So Russia decided to stop exporting grain because they were concerned about their own people, making sure that their own people had grain and food. When they did that, there was a global increase in food prices. By July, from July to December, we saw a tremendous increase, and I don't remember the exact percentages, but they're fairly staggering uh, global increase in food in grain-related food prices. And that created, uh, what, what happened at that point was that people in the oil producing countries who rely very, very heavily on grain, grain based products, their, uh, the cost of a loaf of bread went through the roof. People couldn't feed their families. Uh, it, that, that seemed to correlate to an increase in oil prices in the spring of 2011. Now, mind you, we're looking at time series data from a wide variety of sources that are not necessarily connected to each other. Some of these correlations are tenuous, some are stronger than others, but what we began to see was a telling of an interesting story that showed, cause, that showed what may be cause and effect relationships. Whether this is solid validation that this cause, the, the increased oil prices came from this, is debatable, but, but it's an interesting theory to, to examine. What happened then was, with the increase in oil prices, the harvesting of grain here in the U.S. and in Canada went, went higher because of you know, the, oil, the, the oil needed to harvest that grain. And so therefore, that caused uh, another spike, a secondary spike, in global grain-based food prices, which, which the, these events spanning uh, a year plus translated into a, a, real, ra a real jagged um, curve looking at grain-based food products. This, to me, um, is an example of the kinds of very interesting and possibly actionable things that you can do with data that lives out, out in the world and is available to all of us. Um, now, what action you take on this could be, this is a we need to use our powers for good versus evil kind of discussion. If you're a commodities trader, you might choose to use this in nefarious ways. Um, I know I'm not saying commodities traders are nefarious, but you may, that may be a bad thing. But, but it would be very interesting to be able to make some predictions early in the cycle like this to look ahead and say, if we decide to stop selling grain reserves, Russia, we're going to have a, a, a global impact and we may need to have a conversation about that. And, and of course, then you get into politics, which are complex enough. Um, but this is, to me, is very interesting. So we've got an internet of things We've got an internet of interrelationships that we might be able to stitch together to tell very complex and interesting stories, and hopefully actionable ones. There are some scientists at the University of New York in Rochester that, uh, and you may have seen this, this, uh, this floated around about six months or so ago. Let's see if I can get this started. So, um, This group of researchers looked at Twitter feeds in Manhattan and they began to do natural language processing on tweets and they were able to detect things like, I don't feel so well today, and they were able to separate those things from, I'm, I'm sick about the loss of my puppy from, I feel sick today. And through that, they were able to, with 90% accuracy, predict individuals contracting the flu eight days before they actually contracted the flu. Now, what they're not able to do is, through Twitter feeds, be able to see who those people interacted with and look at disease spread, but, but with a fairly high degree of accuracy, they were able to predict sickness. So now we have the opportunity to look at events. So we've got an internet of things that are producing data, We've got an internet of relationships that we might be able to stitch together, and we've got an internet of events and activities and conversations that we might be able to make some sense, some predictive sense of. So there's a tremendous opportunity to be looking at these things in very uh, innovative and unique ways. 
Um, this is a company called um, Early Warning. Uh, it'll bubble up on the screen here in a second. So each year, a million women are diagnosed with breast cancer. And you may have heard this number because this is fairly uh, highly publicized information. Out of those million, 400,000 of them are expected to die. So four out of 10 women <coughs> who, who are diagnosed with breast cancer die from it. Um, at 12 years, so, so in order to detect a, a, a breast cancer tumor uh, through mammography, it, a, a tumor has to be about one centimeter in size. By 12 years, a tumor grows to four centimeters. It's, it is estimated that breast cancer tumors double in size about every 130 days. So they get big fast. So at 12 years, there are about four centimeters. This is the point at which you would detect a, a, a tumor uh, through, you know, just, just physically. You would be able to feel the tumor. But at 11 years, it's only one centimeter in size. This is about when most mamma mammograms detect a tumor. So 11 years after the tumor begins, I'm sorry, 10 years, 11 years after the tumor begins to grow, it becomes detectable by our current best techniques or at least the most common techniques. I'll, I'll speed up the story here. So working backwards from our 12-year point where the, the tumor is four centimeters in diameter, 11 years at the, the breast exam detects it, here's a really, really good expert mammographer might be able to detect this. This is about two millimeters in size. An MRI would detect it back at about nine years. So even, uh, even the MRI technology, which these are not prescribed for other than high-risk women who are, who are highly likely to already have breast cancer. Um, this first warning sensor detection, com or this first warning company developed a smart bra. And this is still in clinical trials, so it's not out on the market yet. But this is a bra filled with sensors that, that monitor things like body temperature, tissue density, um, a host of different factors. They continue to they continuously collect this data, and they create baselines for the wearer of the bra, so that there is a so that, that that it's known what's within normal range of change and what's outside of normal range of change. And they send messages to the doctor if and when uh, measurements metrics fall outside of normal range. In other words, it makes predictions about possibility or likelihood of, of breast cancer, and it does that in about the first three years of, of the tumor forming. These are, this is the, some of the early research indications. This is pretty fascinating use of technology and data. This is predictive analytics uh, for a very powerful purpose. Bottom line in this is that there is data coming at us from a wide variety of sources We've got our friends give, sending data to each other, to us. We've got our phone that's producing data and our phone that's delivering data. We've got Nike. Uh, Nike has something called the fuel band. If you're a runner, you probably know what this is. Garmin has something similar that, in, that provides GPS location data, heart rate data, et cetera. Um, your feet, your, your, your information about your exercise and fitness program, your world in general, is producing information that about us and for us, and we are leaving this digital exhaust that has tremendous potential value. And I won't get into the ethics uh, that, that go along with this because we don't have time, but there are, there are certainly some ethical questions that go along with this as well. However, having said that, if we use this well, if we take advantage of this data well, we, can, we have the opportunity to enrich our lives. Let's take a, little, let's take a look at analytics now. Um, I want to talk a little bit about creating value from the data. So one of the problems that I see in companies that I work with is a tendency to focus on the data. We've got this data, we need to manage this data, we need to integrate this data, we need to gather this data, we need to cleanse this data, we need data governance, blah, 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 blah. I would much rather have the conversation about what is the potential value in this data? How can, we, how can we make a difference with this data? How can we create a better customer experience with this data? How can we create a more efficient 
operational structure with this data. So I'd like to look at it like this. There's two, two axes. I wouldn't be a good consultant if I didn't put a quadrant up on the screen, right? So where does the data come from? So some data comes from outside the, the, the enterprise. Other data lives within the enterprise. Most, most of your companies today, I would bet, are using only data that is internal to your enterprise. Maybe not even doing a great job at that. So internal data versus external data. And then who are the consumers of the analytical results, that value? Who are the, consum who are the consumers of that value? There are the consumers, the, the, the you and me's, or there are the business decision makers within the enterprise that are using that data for internal business decision making so that they can make, hopefully make our experiences richer. Let's take a look at some examples of this. So historically, we've seen this. Market basket analysis was one of the early predictive analytics uh, techniques that, that came on the scene. Back in the late 80s, early 90s, we were looking at what people tended to buy together. What, what, what do people tend to buy? Um, if they're buying beer, do they tend to buy chips? If, you know, that kind of thing. And you may have heard these kinds of stories back you know, 15 plus years ago. Inventory planning and forecasting. Fraud detection is one of the predominant uses of predictive analytics today. You, you, may, have had, you may have experienced your credit card um, transaction being denied because you were, you were doing something out of the ordinary. Um, I was in Germany not long ago and my credit card kept it being denied everywhere I went. When I called the company, they said, well, you've never been to Germany before. Why, why? We, we thought maybe it got stolen. So fraud detection, customer behavior analysis, these are all fairly classical uh, internal use of data uh, analytics used by the business stakeholders. Let's take a look at the use of external data by business stakeholders. Disease prevention. Uh, so we talked about the, um, the early warning system uh, bra as an example of this. We've got a, a data scientist in South Africa uh, who's a data miner. He's, uh, his background is in machine learning. And um, he, did some, he did quite a bit of work, uh, actually I guess prior to joining ThoughtWorks, he did quite a bit of work looking at all of the features, all of the characteristics of people who have a high likelihood of contracting AIDS or become HIV positive. And he, uh, he found that there were high correlations between the level of education of people in sub-Saharan African countries, the level of their education related to their likelihood of contracting HIV, and so entered into uh, work with governments to help build programs to provide better education uh, not just about HIV, but better education in general. Disease prevention, commodity trading is a, is a biggie using external data. Market sentiment, what are people saying about us, our products, our, their experiences? Delta Airlines has, uh, does a lot of work with um, looking at what people are tweeting or saying on social media about their experiences as travelers. Um, internal data used to benefit us as consumers. So frequent traveler profiles, shopping lists, um, meteorological analysis, I, I, we, m many of us use this on our cell phones every day, looking at what the weather predictions are. Uh, mobile usage analysis, all of this kind of thing is the use of internal data from the enterprise to provide us with some advanced analytics to, to use and, and take advantage of. I'm doing this because I do this on my phone with most of these examples. Um, finally, we get to this external data for the benefit of consumers like you and I. So things like being able to predict our, our, the, the performance of our portfolio financial holdings, our personal portfolios. Foreign currency exchange, if you're into that sort of thing. I met somebody at one of these talks uh, in Toronto who said that, that their business was foreign currency exchange and providing an ex a, 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 a platform for people who were into uh, exchanging foreign currency um, to, to monitor and track and predict things. Fitness tracking, I gave the fuel band example a little while ago. Personal task management, how do I spend my time? Um, when am I most productive? There are some tools to do this. Um, anybody seen, uh, anybody use mint.com for financials? So, so there's a platform that, uh, and, and by the way, I think that Mint is very, very cool and has a whole lot more potential than it's living up to so far. 
You give Mint the ability to bring data in from all of your financial institutions. Yeah, that requires some trust, right? You, you, you provide that ability to consolidate all of your financial data from your bank, your, your stockbroker, your et cetera, et cetera, into one place, and it creates a profile of your, your wealth, your, your wealth profile and your debt profile, et cetera. Um, that's an example where uh, there could be a lot more done with predictive analytics. So this is kind of traditionally where the where enterprise analytics has lived. Uh, retailers have been doing this for years. Bankers have bank uh, financial institutions have been doing this for years. Um, but what's really interesting and what what we believe is the crescent of opportunity are these this use of external data to to deliver analytics as a value added product or service to consumers. So so finding ways to pull data in from outside of your firewall blend it with data that's inside your firewall, deliver new value uh, that's directly into the hands of not just your stakeholders internally, but your consumers on the outside. Let's talk a little bit about how advanced analytics works. I wanna just make sure that we're all on the same page with this term advanced analytics. And this is not the same as BI, which is more historical hindsight reporting. So we have some, some people with, with decision-making interests that would like to use analytics. They have some kind of strategic goals. They articulate those goals and people who are in analytics look for analytical opportunities within these strategic business goals. We turn those analytical opportunities into a, 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 a flow of value that hopefully delivers that key value back to these people and it looks something like this. So first thing we do is we want to discover how will we find the data that might be interesting and actionable. And actionable is key here. I want to avoid just stopping at interesting. Then we need to figure out how we're going to harvest that data. Even if this data is just within your enterprise firewall, it's sometimes very challenging just to harvest that data into a consolidated place where you can do something meaningful with it. How will we gather that data? Then we want to filter it. How are we going to get rid of the useless data? One of the most interesting challenges to me as data volumes get bigger and bigger and bigger is how to leave more and more behind and just bring the things that we need. Um, as we talk about uh, NoSQL technologies and clusters of data, we're now talking about moving the analytics to the data rather than the data to the analytics. So we need to be, figure out creative ways to do that. And MapReduce is one technique, but not the only uh, it doesn't solve all kinds of problems. So we need to eliminate the useless data. We need to integrate the data into uh, some meaningful uh, co combination of disparate, uh, bring the disparate data into some mean meaningful integrated combination. Then we, when we've done this, what we've effectively done is we've converged the data into a cohesive, manageable set that we can begin to analyze. Now we can begin to diverge once again with innovation from that data. This is again just how advanced analytics works in general. Um, so a sequence of analytics uh, uncovers this divergent uh, value opportunity. So we're gonna, we might want to augment the data. Uh, how will we enhance the data with, with either other data or by producing new features, deriving new features. And then we want to, we do the, finally we're ready to do the analysis. So this, this work all back here is that 80 to 90 percent of effort that I talked about earlier. This takes, this is, this is heavy lifting. Finally we get to where we can analyze the data to uncover interesting patterns and discoveries. And then ultimately the, the final and most important question is how do we operationalize that, those analytical models, so that action can be taken and it's not just interesting models and that's really really key now the i think of this as the explore and discover uh, period followed by the analyze and act period and if you don't have this bit then this bit is just wasted time so making sure that you have that analyze and act uh, to figure it out problem with traditional analytics is this timeline so typical Traditional analytics take several months to just pull the data together and get it massaged into an analyzable format. It generally takes a couple of months, maybe shorter, maybe longer, depending on the complexity of the problem, to build a highly valid, highly accurate analytical model, predictive model. So, 
So usually most of this time is spent tweaking and fiddling with the model to make it a little bit more accurate, a little bit more predictive, a little bit more valid. Finally, it takes a few months to put it into production. So this is the, if you're in software development or DevOps, uh, you, you, you're familiar with the kinds of things that happen here. They happen a little differently in analytics, but not, not that much. So it takes, you know, this, this could be a nine month cycle before you actually arrive at something actionable that has value. So let's take a look at Agile Analytics. And, and I, wanna, I wanna shift the focus. So Agile Analytics, we still want to do all of these things. Just like with Agile software development, we still want to do good design, we still want to do good, uh, good testing, good development, et cetera, we just do it in small rapid cycles. So similar, we want to repeat this cycle solving very small embryonic problems evolving toward more mature problems. So a lot of, if you're, if you're familiar with Agile software, then this will not surprise you. So some of the things that we want to think about are small, very simple, very embryonic analytical models built frequently. I sometimes describe this as just a little bit better than flipping a coin as a predictor. Um, we want to validate these models against actual usage. So we want to know that these people out here can benefit by using these models. We want, to, we want to measure that. We want to do that in quantitative ways. So we, we want analytics for our analytics, right? We're going to build an analytical model and then we're going to monitor and measure whether it's doing the job that it's intended to do. And we want to evolve those models, the ones that are keepers, we want to evolve them toward greater power and value for, this, for the, the decision makers that are using that data out here. Let's take a look at an example. So first of all, let's establish a high value business goal. And, then, and, and again, I said this earlier, when, whenever I start talking to people about analytics and they want to start talking about where the data is going to come from or what's, where the data is or what's, you know, how messy the data is, I put the brakes on and say, let's stop and talk about a business goal, a high value business goal. So here's an example. We, we want to identify high value customers who are most likely to leave the company and we want to take action to motivate them not to defect. Um, so you might think shoppers at a retail chain, you might think travelers for an airline or hotel chain, etc. Next, let's, let's choose one small simple aspect of this goal as an analytical jumping off point. So this example will be, or this jumping off point will be, what are the common features of customers who leave? Let's just look at the history of customers and find out which ones left and see if there's some common features that, that define those customers who left and, and haven't seemed to shop with us since then. So we want to start with that and do this very rapidly. I would say this should be about a week of effort or less to answer this question, to get a simple profile of customers who have left in the past. We want to validate that that's a useful idea in order to decide whether we're going to continue. So then we're going to repeat the sequence. So we might just frame a diff slightly different question. What are the behaviors of those customers who leave? What, I'm sorry, what are the shopping behaviors? So what did they buy? What, did they tend to buy similar things? Did they tend to shop in similar ways? So we might, have been, we might enrich the question a little bit by framing it around the shopping behaviors. Then we might want to look at what do customers uh, who are about to leave seem to be saying on social media. Now we're reaching outside the enterprise firewall, looking at data that's publicly available and seeing if there might be something interesting about what customers say before they leave. Maybe there's something there, maybe there's not. Again, if there's not and, and this produces no value, we may need to pivot or we may need to halt this, this decision, this uh, flow altogether. But let's suppose there's something interesting here. We might continue by asking, is there a time series of, of a sequence of events that seem to lead to customers leaving? Can we begin to look at patterns of behavior over time that we can analyze? Now the, ana the analytics is becoming more rich. Uh, can we determine what their sentiment for our company was just before they left? Now we're entering into sentiment analysis and looking at uh, maybe detecting which customers are unhappy or frustrated with their experience. Um, what sequence of events seems to encourage leaving customers to stay? Now, we're looking at other customers who didn't leave, but they happen to look a lot like customers who did leave. 
Now let's look at the events or, or uh, touch points or things that we did that might have kept them around. We don't know for sure, but we're looking now for to see if there are certain kinds of things that seem to, to convince customers to stick with us. And ultimately, we want to ask a question like, have we incentivized our customers properly, and does it ultimately re result in high-value customers who choose to stay rather than leave? And, and we create this cycle. Now we get to this point, and we want to stop, and, and we, by the way, we want to continuously ask the question, have we, have we achieved our business goal? Each one of these cycles should be a matter of days to at most a couple of weeks. So these are possibly our iterations uh, or, or, or some alternative uh, if you're doing flow-based uh, analytics. But the, the point is that we're incrementally evolving toward a much richer uh, um, set of predictive models. Here's another way to think about this. We want to rapidly discover new operate, uh, opportunities to create real and actual va uh, actionable value from the data by starting with an envision. If I only knew X, I could do Y. A lot of questions are that way. Uh, often they're hypotheses, but the point is, if we, if we knew something, we could do something. We want to adjust the levers and, and I want to introduce some terms here, but I, these are not all introductions. We talked about data discovery and harvesting earlier. Data science I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. And data visualization is a whole other topic that augments analytics. So it's an analytical technique in its own right by providing really rich visualizations. We want to manipulate the sliders, these analytical sliders, to discover which ones seem to be producing value rapidly and which ones are not. A uh, good data scientist is really talented at knowing which techniques to use under which uh, circumstances. Um, and then we want to create value. So that, I'm going I'm to move pretty quickly through this. And we want, to, we want to enter into this continuous value delivery stream where we are ramping up the value delivered on a more frequent basis than the traditional analytics. Uh, in addition to the agile approach to developing our analytical models, we want to use a lean learning approach. And, and what we are focused on here is very much, if you're familiar with, with uh, lean principles and uh, lean startup in particular, you're familiar with these terms pivot, double down, and fold. So we want to very quickly kill models that don't have any merit or actionability. Uh, and one of the things that we do is we, we want to measure not, we want to produce an analytical model, but we also want to measure who's using that model for decision making and how much difference is it making. Is it making so we want to create this, this measured quantitative feedback. Let's talk briefly about a data scientist and, and what we mean by data scientist. I often say that a data scientist has sort of PhD level skills in machine learning, things like artificial neural networks, decision trees, support vector machines, clustering. These are all techniques that, that uh, machine learning specialists know how to use. St statistical quantitative analytics uh, includes Bayesian classification, Monte Carlo simulation, logistic regression, k-nearest neighbor. It's just a handful of examples of the kinds of things that data scientists are really, really good at. This is, goes, this is what, the reason I put this up here is because I'm really worried right now that we are on the cusp of starting to see everybody rebranding themselves as a data scientist because it's a hot term. How many of you have heard the, the job term data scientist? It's like, it's, it's blown up in the last two years or less and it has become uh, a, a, it's, it's the hot job opportunity. So I fear that we are at risk of this, uh, of this term becoming heavily watered down and diluted. So this, this person, this data scientist, is very, very talented and skilled at choosing the right techniques to use. In addition, they develop deep domain knowledge. They understand the semantics of the data. They understand the business. They understand business communication. So they can talk to business stakeholders and explain these very complicated results of these models in ways that business stakeholders can appreciate and understand. They also need to have some programming skills. <clears throat> Our data scientists at ThoughtWorks are really good at, R, at programming in R um, and, and Python. 
Uh, they, they know how to do good data manipulation. They know how to do SQL and NoSQL programming in general. So, the, so, so a good data scientist has a really, uh, has a lot of depth in, in these, all of these areas. I'm going to jump us to a, a quick glance at the hype. So, this, so if you're familiar with the Gartner hype cycle, you know what this curve means. So this is the, the peak of, inflate, of inflated expectations is up here, and the trough of disillusionment is down here. And um, technologies go through this hype cycle. And the ones that emerge out of the trough of disillusionment evolve into something that is not as glorious as was anticipated, but is productive. It is something beneficial, and a lot, a lot of things just die on the vine somewhere down in here. Um, so, just to give you a sense, this is the this is called the emerging technologies hype cycle. Gartner does hype cycles for all kinds of technologies. Here's where big data sat as of last summer on the hype cycle. So, guess what you have to look forward to? Um, at least another few months of uh, inflated expectations from the big data, uh, all the big data uh, language. Um, Internet of Things, that wasn't my made up term, that actually is a thing. And it sits down here and the Internet of Things is going to continue to grow. Now let's, let's zoom in on the big data bit. So what we just did was I just, I just bubbled up a couple of things out of all of the various technologies that are related to what we're talking about tonight. Um, the big data hype cycle has some more interesting components in it. And these are all of the sub uh, techniques and technologies that exist within the big data umbrella. So NoSQL technologies are still climbing up the curve. Martin will talk a little bit more about that. Um, predictive analytics have been around for long enough that they've come through this period and they've emerged out here. By the way, I started doing artificial intelligence in the 1980s. And at that time, we were all talking about uh, doing the kinds of things that predictive analytics do now. We just called it AI. Um, well, by about 1989, AI was a word that you could not utter in a boardroom because it had not lived up to expectations. The, the field of AI lives on and it's very powerful, but this notion of AI as the, the answer to all things died somewhere down in here. Predictive analytics made it out the other end and some other, there's a lot of really cool things that came out of all of that. Uh, web analytics sits out here, social analytics. Text analytics is now living right down here. Back about eight or nine years ago, we were talking about doing a lot of unstructured or text mining, text, text data mining, text mining. And um, it never really quite uh, lived up to all of the expectations, but there's still a lot of merit there. I believe that this is gonna emerge out of the trough and it's gonna become a big part of what we continue to do. It just has not, it just didn't turn out to be uh, all that. Uh, predictive modeling solutions. So this is more, uh, this is taking this back and, and turning it into packaged solutions. Um, I'm going to skip this picture in the interest of time because I want to leave a few minutes for questions. But I do want to kind of finish with this. So I've thrown a lot at you tonight. Um, if you're in an organization that's not already doing uh, advanced analytics, these are the things that you have to worry about. New skill sets, new infrastructure, different architectures than the ones that you might be familiar with, which technologies to choose, what tools to use, do we need to hire data scientists and how hard is that, how expensive are they, um, data coming from everywhere, how do we deal with it, finding needles in haystacks is, is that, that's pretty, can be pretty overwhelming, and business demand. Kevin Weil is the um, analytics director, I think I'm saying his title right, uh, for Twitter. And he says that the hard part is, it's, it's no longer hard to find the answer to a single question. The hard part is finding the right question. And as questions evolve, we gain better insight into our ecosystem and our business. This, to me, is key. Every single analytical question that we answer in a meaningful way begets at least 10 new questions or hypotheses. So it just, the, 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 the analytics opportunities just explode into more and more and more questions and, and trajectories and tangents. Um, so, so that, to me, is another argument for the need to do rapid cycle delivery. And I think of it like this. We have cool new technologies for the first time in a long time related to data. We have sophisticated analytical techniques that have been around for a while, but people are getting better and better at them. We have lean learning principles so that we can stop doing what we're doing if it's not adding value. And we have fast, agile delivery mechanisms to, get, to allow us to 
create value continuously or frequently. All of that to me leads to what, what I think is a very exciting emerging field and it's just like all the stars are coming into alignment to do some cool, cool things. Let me pause there and it uh, looks like we've got about five minutes for questions. So I'll pause there and we'll go and uh, got a couple of microphones floating around. So questions? Nope, nothing. All right. Thank you. Uh, I do. The polyglot persistence. Do you want to go back to that one? Yes. Oh, I got it. Okay, so actually this is a, a snippet of a story from eBay. Um, so Tom Fastner is uh, one of the analytics architects at eBay. Uh, he spoke recently at the QCon event here in San Francisco. Uh, in fact, I was a, one of the track chairs and he was on my stage. Um, what was, what's interesting to me about eBay is, and he, this is what Tom says, eBay doesn't make anything, they don't sell anything, they don't produce, they don't provide a service, they provide a platform for people to, to buy and sell things. So all they have is data. Their, their best asset is the data flowing through this. So Tom described a very interesting architecture, and now this is of course a very, very high level. He described a very interesting architecture that has a discover and explore layer followed by an analyze and report layer. This discover and explore layer handles about 20 petabytes of data per day. I don't know if that's right. I think it houses 20 petabytes of data at any given time. This is a Hadoop cluster. It's bringing what they refer to as unstructured data about uh, eBay transactions into the system. Then they have a Teradata platform, but they haven't used the Teradata platform as a structured relational uh, platform. They're using it as a sort of semi-structured semi data collection point, integration point. They refer to it as singularity. That's the name for this platform in, inside eBay. And then, um, and then that moves into a SQL Enterprise Data Warehouse that is Teradata, and it houses about 12 petabytes of data. Now, he, Tom talks about the expected growth over time of these this, but I think the point of me showing this is that this has this houses a high volume of data, but this is a layer in the middle, and most of the ana analysis takes place over here. Most of the processing work get, takes place over here. So one story that he tells about this is when a few years ago, when eBay stopped charging for listings, um, let's see if I can get the story right. When eBay stopped charging for listings, all of those resellers that offer lots of products on eBay said, well, instead of me list, having one listing that says I have a hundred of these items for sale or available, I'll just list each one separately and I'll take up the first three pages of views with my repeated product. So eBay needed to be able or wanted to be able to discover, automatically detect and discover when items were duplicates or when listings were duplicates, collapse them automatically into one. But they're at risk of too many false positives, right? So if you're a, if you're a reseller and all of a sudden eBay is collapsing your item into some other reseller's item, that's bad. So they, they needed not to have any false positives. So what, what they discovered was that the, the most, um, accurate and valid way of doing this is not to read the description of the item or even combine the, the picture with the item, but to actually look pixel by pixel and look at the metadata of the image itself, and, and, there, and along with other factors. So they use this, this area as a way to do the prediction about which items were duplicates of the same listing and then they moved that into here where decisions could be made about consolidating those into a single listing or not. So there's too many listings to do this manually, but there, there may be some manual uh, you know, spot check smoke tests to see if these truly are identical. And so that was, that's, uh, I, I like this story because it shows that the, 
in, in many environments, you need to have both a SQL and a NoSQL uh, kind of environment. This is one, just one example of how they did that. Okay? Did that? Thank you. Do you guys use this technology yourself when you're uh, doing the technology radar for upcoming trends? Oh, that's a good question. I don't do the technology radar, so uh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm actually not sure you're talking about using analytical modeling for technology radar. Martin, do you have any insight into this? Uh, uh, the way we do the radar is purely based on the 20 or so people on the advisory tool. Okay. So, I mean, there are people out there that will mine Google things or job trends or whatever. And yeah, we may use that as a bit of an input. But fundamentally, the tech radar is based on what have we got particularly first-hand experience of. That, that, that's where we think we've got a, a particular insight. Because we can say, yeah, people are talking about this technology, we've tried it out, and therefore we've got a better feel as to whether it's worthwhile. Anything else? All right, thanks very much. I think we're going to take a 15 minute break. Yeah, we'll take about a 15 minute break, and then uh, Martin will be on after that. Great. Okay, thanks, thanks everyone.